Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. Thank you for joining me for this week's edition of the SMIE Consulting Midweek Roundup. I'm your host, Marty Bennett, and today on the Roundup, we're going to be answering three questions we've been hearing from international educators over the last week and a week and 10 days. So these are some great questions that we've been getting, and we think that they, uh, a lot of the news stories that we'll be alluding to in these answering these questions will kind of uh, give you a flavor of why uh, these issues are really important in terms of how we frame international education discussions on our campuses, in our country, at conferences around the world. So uh, as we do each week, uh, to give those who are new to the Roundup a little bit of a refresher, uh, we do take all the themes for our, new st for our questions from our newsletter that comes out on Mondays, and that's called All the SMIE News Fit to Share, and I'm dropping the link to both the uh, uh, online version through uh, MailChimp that you can subscribe to on our, on our SMIE consulting website, or uh, we've launched also a, a, a LinkedIn version of the newsletter that uh, just two weeks ago, and it's already gotten over 500 subscribers. Really thanks to everyone who's subscribed to the newsletter and is now sharing this content uh, with their own audiences. Uh, it's a great, uh, great time to be in international education. There's a lot happening around the world. And what we're going to share today are going to be some of the topics that are really uh, defining in a lot of ways the kinds of topics that we're dealing with uh, on our campuses and the issues that we really need to be uh, aware of and in front of uh, as we proceed forward in our day-to-day -day interactions with our uh, colleagues on campus that might be maybe unaware of some of the global implications of what's going on in other countries and other themes that have been developing over the years. So uh, we do refer to the newsletter quite a bit as we go through uh, the roundup each week, but I just want to make sure everyone's aware of where you can subscribe to that and make sure you have a copy of the latest version uh, before we get to our midweek roundup on Wednesdays uh, so we can give you a, you can get a chance to maybe uh, anticipate what the three themes that we'll be covering are. So let's uh, talk about what those three questions we'll be covering today are. First up, how are major destinations uh, countries are receiving recovering from COVID-19? Second, will China ever reopen to international students? And third, do career services offices need to evolve for international students? So we'll talk about these three questions and more on today's Midweek Roundup. First question of the day, how are the major destination markets for international students recovering from COVID-19? And obviously the fall of 2021 is the, uh, the latest intake that we have real data from uh, for all countries. And that really shares um, a picture across the board that recoveries are underway in various forms. Uh, we know in Australia, uh, Borders have only just reopened in the latter half of 2021, and it's been a slower than anticipated uptake uh, in, in uh, new students coming in in the spring, but we don't have those numbers in terms of what we're going to be reporting on today. Uh, there are three pieces of three articles that I'm, I'll be referencing. First up is a, a fantastic ICEF Monitor article that actually outlines all four of the major destinations, Australia, uh, Canada, U.S., U.K., all with uh, detailed examples of what's and numbers to back it up in terms of what the percentage is of students uh, as of this past fall term uh, that we're enrolling around from around the world to those four major destination markets. Some fantastic data. We're going to go through that, but I'll drop the link to that in the, the comments section on the Facebook page as well as the other uh, platforms that we're sharing this out across. Uh, and again, this is a new, new, for fairly new format for us on the Roundup. We used to do it just on our Facebook page for SMIE Consulting, but now we're doing it uh, multi-stream uh, across uh, LinkedIn, Twitter, YouTube, and Facebook, all live at 1 p.m. Eastern every Wednesday. So please do uh, make a note of it. And if you can't subscribe to the live events as we are now, uh, please feel free to uh, download the podcast on any of your major platform favorite podcast providers, Spotify, Stitcher, iTunes, whatever, uh, wherever you find your podcasts, you'll likely be able to find the SMIE Consulting Midweek Roundup. So, uh, But the ICEF article uh, really is important because I think it gives 
for my money, the best overview of the major destination markets. Really goes into some detail on uh, the major um, implications and factors that are affecting demand and travel ability. Uh, they make the clear statement that travel restrictions are no longer expected to hamper international student mobility, that demand for study abroad is on the rise post-pandemic, International students are currently deciding where they want to study this coming academic year, and competitor destinations are actively recruiting in priority markets. And that's uh, that's something that's uh, been very important, I think. Uh, you've seen other moves uh, by uh, Canada uh, in terms of their generous post-study work rights and immigration opportunities. Other countries are catching on a little bit and uh, trying to uh, take a bit bite out of their market share, uh, at least in their favorability ratings for uh, uh, immigration and post-study work. Uh, the UK has reinstated their two-year post-study work vi rights visa. The US uh, has recently extended OPT uh, STEM STEM OPT uh, academic programs that are qualify for that extra two years of work experience. And Australia is also becoming more generous with work rights uh, to recover after nearly two years of border closures. So there's a lot going on uh, and a lot of investment by these uh, top four uh, destinations in China and India. No surprise there. Uh, they're interest interestingly, the uh, ICEF report does break down a few important details by market uh, in terms of where uh, the, like the top five uh, source countries uh, for, uh, for each of the major destinations uh, and where, how heavily dependent they are on those five countries. Uh, for example, Australia, 72% of, mark, mark, of their students come from their top five source markets, China, Nepal, Malaysia, India, and Vietnam. U.S. 61 percent, so a little bit better diversity there, uh, with China, Korea, Canada, India, Saudi Arabia as a top five. U.K. only 45 percent dependent on the, their top five, China, U.S., India, Hong Kong, Italy. And that's primarily because of their proximity to Europe and the uh, pre-existing relationships with most of the EU countries in, in terms of establishing regular solid flows of students. Those have decreased uh, post-Brexit, but certainly they're uh, still uh, still got some significant uh, diversity built in for them in terms of the, where their pipelines are coming from. Canada uh, is kind of in between the U.S. And, and Australia in terms of reliance. There are 66 percent of university enrollments internationally are dependent on their five top sources. And India is their number one. China is falling as their number two. Vietnam also falling. France and South Korea that round up the top five. They do, in the ISIF article, also go in country by country to look at where the biggest growth was in uh, the four major markets uh, for Australia, upticks significantly in Philippines, Sri Lanka, Pakistan, and Indonesia. Now, these are numbers from their visa, uh, visa numbers for uh, enrollments through December uh, of 2021. Now, we know that the academic year in uh, Australia starts February, March, and that's when the majority of students, January, February, are coming into the country. Uh, we've we reported on the last couple of weeks that there actually haven't been as significant a, a wave as Australian institutions might have hoped, particularly lags in coming from, from China, uh, and doubt numbers are down certainly from China anyway, but uh, certainly uh, some decreases are in, in the number of Indian students, though their overall visa numbers are up, the re-enrolling numbers are, are down. Uh, so we got some, there are some issues there for Australia. Canada is seeing uh, some significant decreases uh, in China and Vietnam and South Korea. Uh, South Korea certainly been a declining num uh, country for the U.S. for years, but uh, uh, Canada is starting to see that. Vietnam especially, I think Canada, uh, maybe uh, Vietnamese are turning away from Canada a bit and maybe looking back towards the U.S. Uh, as another, as a, as a more preferable destination and some other some other countries as well in uh, in the region, perhaps the UK as well. So we do see a lot of fantastic data in here, and on top of the uh, the Cevus by the Numbers report that came out as well, and I'll be dropping the links to both the uh, ICE um, release of that data, of that Cevus data, as well as uh, the another ICEF report on that, uh, also into the chat. What's interesting about the U.S. and obviously uh, most of our our focus here on the midweek roundup uh, is taking a look at some of these global trends uh, and, uh, importantly, U.S. trends uh, from a U.S. perspective and the implications most directly because that's obviously the area that um, 
I'm most familiar with over my 29 years in the field. But uh, the, ISTAT, uh, the ISTAT is certainly reveals the broad strokes of what's happening. And we've seen that data reflect uh, an overall, uh, maintain an, an overall decrease of uh, under just under 2% of, of excuse me, 1.2% over 2020 uh, in 2021. So there was still a decline. Uh, what CVIS data, and this is where the differences are between um, CVIS by the numbers, which is actually the, as real a time data you can get for, uh, for international students in the U.S. and as comprehensive as you can get because it includes F, M's, uh, and J's as well. Uh, what is, uh, the, this, this, this actually, this report actually just includes F's and M's, so the exchanges are uh, probably fairly non-existent from last year anyway, but uh, for apples to apples, it's not the same as Open Doors. Open Doors includes uh, just the respondents to uh, the Open Doors survey, which includes a, a fair share of those that are, do enroll in international students in the U.S., but does not include um, does not include uh, high schools or, and M programs typically that are um, exclusively M programs that are more vocational education. So, uh, CVS does capture as uh, it does capture the J's, but they're not reported in this in this report. Uh, but the numbers, and it's about as comprehensive you can get and as real time as you can get. What we're going to see in November from Open Doors through IIE will be reflective of what was enrolled in the United States in the 2020-21 academic year. But they'll report on it uh, in, in uh, excuse me, the 21-22 academic year, the year that's just finishing. Uh, they'll report on that in November of 2022. So uh, that will be a little bit different. But what it will reflect is probably what uh, the ICE report and the ISF monitor uh, detail article, deep dive into the, into the numbers, uh, does reflect. And that it was, while there was a 1.2% drop overall uh, for a total of uh, 1,236,748 FNMs in the United States in 2021, in 2020-21, uh, we now see, um, uh, or excuse me, 21, yeah, 20, yeah, two, it was an annual report ending for 2021. So uh, the, what it did show is that the most significant drop was actually in the, high, in the uh, K through 12 sector. Uh, that there were uh, nearly 9,500 fewer K through 12 international students enrolled in the U.S. in 2021. That's a 16% decline, and that's uh, that's understandable because most of these students are either uh, in boarding schools or living with host families. Most of the international students that are in the U.S. So it's not surprising uh, that uh, there was a decline uh, in those numbers. Parents may be a little bit more reticent to send their kids overseas during a pandemic. It certainly makes sense. And, uh, at the high school age. So what uh, the report also in the ICF Monitor uh, article reflects that actually the, uh, we see that uh, though at the high school level, K through 12 sector was down uh, 16%, uh, the higher ed sector was actually up 1.8%. And if I'm not, for, not f uh, forgetting it, uh, that was very similar to the snapshot survey maybe a little under the snapshot survey from last fall as to what enrolled fall 2021 uh, in terms of new international enrollments in the fall. So this is obviously total enrollment. So that 1.8% is probably an overall growth that we'll see in uh, new international students uh, for the 2022 Open Doors report that we'll get in November this year. So uh, that uh, some great data in there. Uh, the, where the largest growth was uh, in the higher ed side, overall 1.8% up. Uh, the, the highest growth was 6.6% 6. Uh, 6 growth in master's degree program students, uh, and that's uh, up over a, a minus 16% decrease in 2020. So that's those are certainly significant numbers, and um, a 6.7% increase in doctoral programs too. So that's that's very encouraging. Uh, bachelor's programs were fairly stable, a little bit of a de decrease, 0.5% of a decrease over 2021. 2020 uh, was where there was a 13% decrease over the year before. So uh, undergraduate internationals make up 38% of total number of international students in higher ed, down from 40%. So grad students are kind of leading the charge back 
and then we would expect undergraduates would follow in the next year to two years. So some great data in that ICEF article, ICEF Monitor article on the U.S. numbers. So certainly recommend checking all of those out because there's going to be some great, uh, great data there uh, for, for you to dig your teeth into. Uh, and I, we could talk for quite a while on what's happening uh, with these numbers, and it seems like every week there's a different source that comes out reflecting some uh, another trend in another country or another um, another uh, disaster or another uh, political event or new legislation that impacts uh, uh, an overall uh, destination's overall up. Um, appeal to international students and we that's what we could try and keep our finger on the pulse on here at the roundup uh, is to, to to really dive into some of these trends and see what's what's perhaps behind them if this is a part of a longer term uh, tr trend we're seeing or if it's something that uh, is just a flash in the pan just uh, uh, yesterday's news uh, by the time uh, we, we, we ever uh, get any resolution to it. But uh, certainly I think you're going to see a lot of happening uh, in the coming months, a lot of more proactive stances taken by governments uh, to ease the transition for international students, ease the process. And certainly uh, we're seeing that in some of the, some of the countries uh, with easing visa processing. And uh, in, the, in India, for example, the U.S. is changing it the way it will do visa interviews uh, and who's, who's allowed to make those appointments. So we're really seeing some uh, positive um, positive energies uh, around this and under government's understanding they need to up their game if they're going to uh, maintain uh, their uh, grip on their market share and hopefully increase. So next topic, will China ever reopen to international students? Now, those who have uh, been with us on the Roundup for a while you know that we've talked extensively about what China has done pre-pandemic in terms of making itself a leading destination, frankly, for international students. So not only are they the top sender of students outside uh, their home countries for study uh, overseas, they are one of the top five now, or they up, were up to top three, maybe even top two at one point, and in terms of a destination for international students. And a lot of that is on the back of uh, China's uh, BRI, Belt and Road Initiative, uh, over the past 15 years that has invested hundreds and billions, even trillions of dollars in the developing world uh, for infrastructure projects, for uh, um, civic projects, for uh, university uh, relations, for scholarship programs, all of that designed to increase China's soft power in the world. And you can see some of that uh, uh, being reflective in what's going on with uh, the conflict in the Ukraine. That's a story for another day. But uh, what we have seen since the pandemic is China has basically curled up into a ball and isn't letting people in. Uh, and you can now travel to China uh, for business, but you will be in quarantine for 14 days. Uh, then uh, you're under very strict watch. Uh, and in fact, we're going to be sharing uh, State Department's uh, travel advisory for uh, Shanghai in particular, but China in general. Uh, it's a travel for advisory. Don't travel to China. They're recommending, U.S. government's been recommending that for weeks now. Uh, actually came out um, uh, well, they've updated it. Uh, China's now, it was level four, now it's level three. Uh, but they're calling it uh, because uh, they took everybody off, the CDC took everybody off the uh, level four uh, this past week, uh, or just in the last day or so. But uh, they are saying reconsider travel to the People's Republic of China due to arbitrary enforcement of local laws and COVID-19 related restrictions. Uh, do not travel to the uh, Hong Kong uh, Special Administrative Region. Uh, and Shanghai do not travel there either due to COVID-19 related restrictions, including the risk of parents and children being separated. So uh, there, I've, if I, you've probably seen what's happening in Shanghai, and if you haven't, check it out because it's 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 frightening what's going on there. Um, there seems to be, for a number of reasons, uh, China has main, tried to maintain the zero COVID policy, uh, tolerance policy for COVID, and it's not worked. Uh, the variant, the Omicron variant that they're dealing with now, uh, Omicron 2 uh, BA, uh, I think it is the BA, uh, 2A or what, 2AB or two, whichever one it is, uh, is much more virulent, uh, but it's not as 
uh, health effects aren't as damaging. Uh, they've recorded very few deaths, but who knows how many deaths there actually have been. But they have basically cocooned their population into a bubble for the last two years. Uh, they have had vaccines that are generally effective, 60, 65 percent effective, but not as nearly as effective as the Western uh, uh, Moderna, Pfizer ver versions, Johnson & Johnson. So you see, um, and they aren't as, those vaccines aren't as effective against uh, the, uh, the, more, uh, the more recent str uh, strands, including Omicron. Uh, you've had a trend, though, though they've, uh, uh, they've uh, vaccinated a billion people there, uh, you still have a large number of elderly populations, the most at risk, that refuse to get vaccinated. Uh, and they're probably the ones that are going to uh, uh, face the greatest uh, challenges. But you see happening in, in China, particularly in Shanghai, their largest city, 26 million people that have been on their lockdown in one way. Or, and not, uh, when we say lockdowns, it's not U.S. lockdowns. Lockdowns really here, and maybe in some of the larger cities there were some restrictions and police uh, would and and, and uh, curfews and such. But uh, th this it's whole next level stuff in China in terms of what they've been enforcing. Uh, in terms of if you even if you're asymptomatic, you're going to be sent to a quarantine facility uh, that's basically uh, substandard housing. Uh, that's uh, and, and then extended delays. And if you're trying to travel in China during this, forget about it. Um, it makes it uh, extremely difficult, and it's not uh, not a place where you certainly want to be going with family. Uh, again, based on the State Department travel warning, uh, really a negative uh, negative uh, perspective in terms of what's going on. And for international students that didn't leave, uh, they've been uh, basically under significant monitoring already from the Chinese government. But uh, because of the COVID restrictions, and they've been really limited in terms of their movement on, in many campuses, restricted to campuses and needing permission to go off campus. Uh, and for those that have been trying to get back in, there's, they haven't had any luck in doing that unless you're an NYU Shanghai or a Duke Kunshan student or maybe some of the other British universities that have campuses there haven't had that, any luck in getting back in. Uh, and there's also a, st a story out from Study International about the Shanghai lockdown. What does China's relentless zero COVID strategy mean for students? And it talks about the, the impact of that and on, on students that have been trying to get back in, on those that are there now. Uh, thanks, uh, uh, John, for being a part of the webinar today. Hope, uh, hope uh, you're enjoying it. And uh, hopefully we get up to see you in Toledo uh, next time you're in town. Uh, thanks for being a part of that conversation. Now, in terms of uh, in terms of uh, what's happening in China, there's there's obviously some impacts long term on what's going on there. Uh, we've seen um, the challenges that China's had in terms of trying to reopen. Uh, they've they've talked about it, but never ever set a date. And there have been students that have been taking their classes online uh, that maybe had left or were trying to get in before the pandemic uh, hit and didn't get in in time. And you now see um, now see what's happening to a lot of students that have tried to get in from the South Asia that have been taking uh, their classes on their phones, on their mobile devices. And they've been doing that for two years. And now they, they still can't get back in to, to finish their programs. Uh, same thing was happening in Australia. You'd see that happening. So and paying the paying the paying the tuition rates as if they were in person. So there's a lot of negative damage that's been done uh, to China and their reputation for uh, for being a destination for international students. And uh, we'll have a lot of uh, ground to make up um, when and if they do open again. But if as long as they um, are are hanging on this uh, zero COVID tolerance policy. Uh, it's not going to happen. International students simply won't be able to return, and you'll see a cratering of uh, their international uh, student enrollments there uh, if they haven't already. Uh, we won't see numbers from them for a while either, so because uh, it will be negative news. So we don't ne they don't like to share that with the world. So what's um, what's next for China? It's it's anyone's guess at this point, but it's certainly a return for international students is is not happening anytime soon, and certainly. Recruitment travel there uh, for U.S. institutions, I wouldn't be counting on that anytime soon either. And uh, if you have agents or other third parties on the ground in China, that's probably your best bet uh, to keeping up your finger on the pulse of what's going on in that market. Because 
Uh, you need that intelligence from somewhere. And if you can't travel there, which you're not going to be anytime soon, uh, and realistically, you're going to have to rely on uh, those your third party uh, parties on the ground to help you uh, make the case for your institution. So we'll see see what happens down the road, but uh, not looking promising anytime in the in the next couple of months at least. We'll see how many uh, folks from China come to NAFSA. That'll be a, uh, an indicator of whether maybe how many uh, whether they're reopening again in any way to what's happening in the West. So our third and final question of the day. Do career services offices need to evolve for international students? Now, many of you who have followed us uh, on the Roundup for a number of weeks or months uh, know that when we talk about international student enrollment in the United States, we talk, talk about it from the perspective of prospect to alumni status. Uh, that institutions need to have a holistic approach, not only to just how they admit students, and everybody says they use a holistic approach when they do uh, admit, uh, but the reality is you should be taking that same approach throughout that student's journey on your campus, recognizing that these international students have different needs than your average domestic student or even your average out-of-state student. So it's important to have uh, not just an international student and scholar service office that helps them with the, the legal and immigration related concerns that they have that they need to do, keep in status uh, during throughout their time on campus, but you also have the need for other departments that in fact uh, affect their lives uh, from academic advising, from housing, from uh, student employment offices, uh, to department offices, to alumni offices, to career services offices that have to have knowledge of the kinds of issues these students are going to be dealing with as they move out into the work world. And throughout their journeys on your campus, they, there will be things that come up that are slightly off center in terms of it doesn't fit the normal approach you have with dealing with international students. So it requires a different solution. And when, particularly when it comes to the end product, the outcomes, and we always talk here about how important outcomes are for prospective student audiences and parents, particularly at the undergraduate level, but certainly your grad students uh, for master's and doctoral programs, they want to know outcomes too when they enroll, before they enroll. They want to know what their degree is going to get them and what the possibilities are. They're not necessarily uh, expecting a guaranteed job, but they'll need to know what the, their chances are to get into certain fields, what their starting salaries might be. Will they be able to tr work outside the United States? Uh, and that is the challenge when we talk about career services evolving. It's not only being aware of the kinds of issues that they deal with on a regular basis uh, in terms of the limitations they might have if uh, they want to do an internship, uh, they have to get it approved uh, as a CPT, a curricular practical training uh, opportunity by their designated school official on campus. And it has to be within uh, or established part of the curric curriculum for that program to do an internship. Uh, and how that's interpreted on different campuses will vary, and that's all well and good. But career services may have a role, a very important role to play with that on your campus if they're working with different departments uh, that regularly have uh, uh, companies from outside hire their, their students for internships in their junior and senior year. Uh, that's something that career services need to be in the loop on, on what those requirements are and when they're vet, vetting companies for that are coming to campus for internships, for job fairs, uh, for uh, interviews, they need to know uh, or should be capturing in one way or another which companies are willing to hire international students uh, or sponsor students eventually for H-1B. And that's a, that's a service international or career services offices can and should provide for their students so that they're aware of and can focus their efforts accordingly on companies that are coming that might want to hire them for an internship or that they can potentially interview for or work for and maybe work overseas for. And that's the other piece of how career services centers can evolve uh, in evolve in terms of where students want to work. Uh, not necessarily saying that they're going to be a placement agency for uh, for students in, in various other countries, but they need to be aware of resources that are out there uh, that students can t tap into to find about find out about jobs. Not not even in just the U.S., but uh, their home countries, maybe a third country where they have an interest in going to to work. Uh, that's now becoming. Uh, 
not an expectation, but certainly if, a, if an institution can provide resources to connect students with those kinds of opportunities abroad, they are putting themselves at a much better advantage in terms of convincing that student that, that you really know what you're doing and you're, you're an institution that really cares about where they go and what happens next after they leave. Uh, the transition from international student to international graduate alumni is a tricky one at most institutions. Uh, most schools don't capture international alumni data. Uh, they might have, have, uh, be, have relied on third-party tools like Handshake and other opportunities that mines uh, LinkedIn for uh, connections with other institute, or with alumni of, other, of, of your institution. There's a lot of that uh, content that uh, is out there now, but Connecting with alumni networks, providing services for that group, uh, that's something that career services can, and can work with alumni on and in developing that specifically for international students. So there's a lot more that we could talk about on this career services issue, but certainly a lot that I think uh, most, of, most of us who are in the field realize is a much larger conversation and one that's not going to be solved today. But certainly we thank you for, you sp for spending the time uh, live with us here on uh, our midweek roundup here at Wednesday at 1 p.m. Eastern. Uh, thanks to those who have been watching on Facebook, uh, YouTube, uh, LinkedIn, and Twitter. Uh, glad to have somebody uh, connecting on all those platforms today to check out the roundup. Uh, so until next time, we wish you all the very best, and we'll see you around the way. Cheers. <laughs>